This is Live Well Talk on Structural Cardiology. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Union Point Health St. Luke's Hospital. Returning to the award-winning pro- podcast today is Dr. Richard Kellekamp, Medical Director for St. Luke's Heart Care Services, to discuss what is structural cardiology, procedures performed here at St. Luke's, as well as the future uh, of structural cardiology and cardiology services in general. Dr. Kellekamp, welcome back. Thanks for be- having me. How's your, you know, you've been on a couple times. Has your life changed? Same old, same really? old grind. No, really? no, no, no. no. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it keeps changing. The Does world it? of cardiology, there's always something new, uh, you know, doing uh, new things in the mitral space. We've got TriClip coming, and we could talk about all those things, yeah, but there's a lot of new, new yeah, things mean, on the horizon. Uh, structural cardiology, uh, if you didn't know anything about it, it that you could interpret or infer a lot. So sure. what is a structural cardiology? Well, it, it uh, implies there's a some structural problem with the heart, and that often involves the valves. The valves are these one-way doors, let blood go one direction, um, and there's a problem with one of them. And so the, the first place that we did these non-invasive structural procedures was replacing the aortic valve. So something that many people have heard about, transcutaneous aortic valve replacement, or TAVR. And that's kind of where this was sort of born. Um, but we could also... Uh, plug holes in the heart. We can uh, treat mitral valve disease. Um, You know, there's a number of things that we can do that are actually sort of structural uh, problems with the heart. We had one of your colleagues on, Dr. Bansel, and we talked about just cardiology in general and valve disease, heart disease, you know, arterial disease, et cetera. Right. I was kind of surprised the incidence of valvular disease actually is not going down. Uh, You would think with more and more people on the planet uh, going through their childhood with penicillin or access to penicillin. Sure. Be less rheumatic fever, less rheumatic heart disease. And, um, but, but he, he was telling us that, no, not really that it's actually going up. Yeah. If you think about the, the incidence of valvular disease being from, you know, rheumatic valvular disease, it's pretty low. Now, if you lived in India, you know, the, the incidence of, of rheumatic valve disease is huge. And so a lot of times, um, you know, a few years ago, you would go to India to learn how to do balloon, aortic, balloon mitral valve uh, commissurotomy and things. Is that because rheumatic? rheumatic because no access? Yeah. That was no access to penicillins and, you know, basically a third world country. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in the United States, it's been eradicated. You had an episode of strep throat, you get antibiotics. So right. you don't have to suffer from this. Now there's an I, occasion I, where you I see I can it. remember a board exam question for one of the times I've sat for it. I can't remember maybe the first or the 10 year mark, you know, goes all blend together. But it was a pregnant uh, Eskimo with hemoptysis, you know, so... Okay, it's mitral valve disease, right? You sure. know, because they had uh, pulmonary hypertension from valvular disease because they were grew up uh, indigenous and didn't have access to penicillin. Yeah, you know, so it's kind of that classic you think about. But uh, sure. Uh, so you, they, yeah, they you guys used to go to India to to learn how to do mitral valve commissurotomy. So because the mitral valve disease is so prevalent wow. there. Yeah, didn't know and that. So yeah, yeah. Have you ever been to India? I have not. Yeah, me neither. That's kind of on my bucket list, I would think. I'd like yeah. to go there once. Yeah, yeah. My my uh, my fellowship mate went to India to do just that. And he came back and we were in Echo Conference. And he's over, he's next to me, and he has, has these terrible rigors. Oh, gosh. Would and he get malaria? He got malaria. Yeah, so we did a peripheral smear. So it was a little, uh, you know, it was education for all of us. Because you never see malaria in the United no. States either. Well, I we had a case of malaria at our Memphis in Des Moines. That came over from Broadlands, and I'll never forget this because this back pen and paper, you know, right? Right. This is late '90s, and the Broadlands resident, family practice resident, had written. I was going through his orders. I was admitting it to the intensive care unit at Methodist, and one of those nursing instructions was "kill all mosquitoes in room." <laughs> okay, which I thought that was pretty funny. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So. You, well, we've kind of implied with our uh, in the weeds conversation there that requires some extra training. What extra training does it require to be a structural cardiologist? Well, there's fellowships. So you, so you do your general cardiology. Right. 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 And then you go on to do, you subspecialize, which I, I paid a compliment to the cardiology, our group here. I think pr- even prior to joining Unity Point, even before when Unity Point was still Iowa Health System, 
I, I think I think the I think your group did a good job of saying, you know what, specialization is going to be the future here. We can't all be interventionalists. We can't all be the right. the echo gurus. We're going to have need to divide and conquer. And I think you guys were, really were about five years ahead of the 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 wave that followed. So sure. it's not unusual now. We talked. We did a, a podcast on inpatient cardiology and uh, how we try to become more efficient with our time. So. So, but tell us about, just kind of take us through how, if, if I was a, going to, if I was, how would I become a structural cardiologist? Well, you know, I mean, the whole process of med school right, after right. college and, and then residency and internal medicine. And then, and then you do general cardiology, which is a three-year residency or fellowship. And then, um, and then you subspecialize in inter- interventional cardiology. So then you do, uh, you know, coronary vascular intervention. And then after that... It's a one or two year fellowship in structural training. So, you know, what is that? 17 years down the road after uh, high school. So it's a long haul. Um, a lot of specialized training. Some of this was young enough that structural cardiology came about, you know, during my life as a cardiologist. So a lot of this that I've learned, I've done on the job. Yeah. And yeah. so that's, that's different. Um, uh, but we've, you know, there are structural programs out there, and those are relatively new and kind of novel things. Right. And the, so, but like everything else, they'll probably become a little bit more commonplace and certified, accredited. Excuse me. Correct. Um, as time goes on, I think right now cardiology uh, is where G. I, I mean, I've observed this in gastroenterology in my career, where it's just this explosion of technology comes right. out of the scene, and it just it goes from nothing new to everything's new. Right. Uh, and I think cardiology is right in that wave right now, particularly uh, structural uh, sure. like physiology. Right. Um, it is. It truly is. Yeah. I, you know, everything's becoming less invasive. Um, you know, if you can avoid open heart surgery, people want to. Um, there's still a lot of necessary open heart procedures, but then there are a lot of patients, a big population of patients who just aren't surgical candidates. And that's where t- TAVR, vo- aortic valve, uh, intervention was born. Well, the, the, there are a lot of people who have severe aortic valve stenosis and they don't express symptoms until they're 88. And, you know, you're not an ideal, typically not an ideal surgical candidate at 88 years of age. And so those patients were just treated medically. And we know that the, the downstream is that those patients are going to die of the disease. Um, and so TAVR came along, much less invasive approach, um, put a new valve in. And not surprisingly, when they compared aortic valve replacement in the early days percutaneously by a catheter compared to medical therapy that that the valve replacement blew them out of the water. Have, have they studied valve uh, replacement, open heart surgery, versus TAVR mm-hmm. yet? I mean, what's, what's the they comparison have. there? Yeah, so, um, so the... the the way that this has sort of evolved was it started out in the non-operative patient, as many th- technologies do, right. and then they decided, well, we'll take the high-risk surgical patients and we'll compare those patients to surgery. And it turned out that TAVR kind of had some uh, equivalency. And then it, they looked at moderate-risk patients, you know, people who had a STS score of less than six who moderate. were yeah, moderate risk in, in the surgical arena. Um, and they compared the two, and it turned out that the the TAVR patients um, have done just as well, if not better. And then the low risk patients, so these are the people you'd think would do best with surgery, and they do, they do do very well with surgery, but it turns out that the that TAVR actually has superiority in terms of outcome for low risk patients uh, needing valve replacement. Now the challenge of course is a lot of low risk, low risk patients are young and you can't put a fully prosthetic valve in with a catheter. It has to be a bioprosthetic valve and there's pluses and minuses to both approaches, but the plastic and metal valve, the prosthetic valve potentially lasts forever. So if you're- So are, are they to the point, and I know I know this is how you're, the age group that you typically treat, but you hear about these children that have some sort of uh, valve disease that they have to have several surgeries because they grow, right? Right, right. I mean, are we gonna get to a point where, well, just pop in a TAV or a TAV or a TAV, or, okay, now we'll put in their permanent one. Probably not in the sense that a TAVR valve can't be explanted. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you put it in and you know what? You're going to put in another valve inside of that valve. And so that's kind of a, a future that we face. We put in a TAVR valve 
And if a patient outlives that valve replacement, which could happen, you you have a young, sort of healthy 75 year old who gets a, a valve replacement, um, that valve eventually is gonna fail that person. I, we would argue 10 to 15 years down the road, but then that same patient's 90 and now needs another valve because their prosthetic valve has failed. We just put another valve inside of that one. And so really? make a valve sandwich. Yeah. A valve sandwich. Yeah. It works pretty well. Not what the Earl sandwich had in uh, mind probably, but right. that will work. The expansion in the heart center. Sure. Which did have a Super Bowl ad. Right, right. Uh, That's or pretty during the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good commercial. So tell us about the expansion and what that is going to bring to the community. Yeah. It's it's a, a, a big commitment by Unity Point Health to, you know, to really solidify uh, our service lines, you know, $25 million capital uh, capital uh, investment in um, EP, so electrophysiology, and that's the first phase of the of this we, process. We've had Dr. Uh, Lee on. The, oh, yeah, the great. Yep. So, sh so you, you know, I'm sure your listeners know about that. So that's kind it'll of probably, the first. It'll probably be rated higher than the one with you, but that's okay. Go well, on, go on. I we know that. Go on. I didn't mean to. We're not break going your, into this. I didn't mean to break your concentration. Sorry about that. <laughs> Kind of hurts, but it's okay. So that so the um, so the the second EP lab, which is something that's sorely needed, because we have some a yeah. really busy electrophysiology service. So that'll be that'll be great. Uh, the second phase, then, will be vascular labs on the fifth floor, and we'll be moving our non-invasive therapies, um, echo and and you know nuclear and stress testing to a, to a different floor. Uh, but it'll all be consolidated in one area, uh, and then vascular will move up to the to the uh, fifth floor where Dr. Cray, Dr. Lawrence, myself, and Dr. Crony will be doing vascular procedures. Well, it, just from a healthcare, health industry, young people perspective, I mean, I, I can't say this enough. There are so many career opportunities in healthcare right now that are just going to continue to grow, whether you're an ultrasound tech, an echo tech, a certified right. surgical assistant, cath lab personnel. Uh, it's not always doctors and nurses, you know, there's a lot of other, there's, it's a team. Sure. And uh, you can just, you can, you can feel that growth that's going to be there. You right. Know? So it is an exciting time for young people to be uh, entering the, the, the profession. And you bet, it, you know, you don't have to have 17 years of training. You can uh, Which... have hands on day to day, a uh, significant contribution to the patient care uh, with uh, a lot less time. Right. Uh, for sure. Sonography being the classic example. Yeah, yeah. Radiographers, yeah. yeah. Nursing, you know, a lot of people think nursing, you're going to go to a floor and take care of patients. Yeah. But, you know, it's an exciting opportunity in the cath lab. I, yeah, the, the, the laterality and the horizontal uh, potential for uh, someone with a, a, a master's in nursing is is very wide and very long. You bet. Know, very steep. You bet. So, me and you were just uh, move along seeing patients and uh, that's right. Just a cog in the wheel. <laughs> well, Dick, thanks for stopping by again. Once again, this is Dr. Kettlecamp uh, joining me to discuss about structural cardiology. Uh, he is the medical director for St. Luke's uh, Heart Care Services. To learn more, visit unipoint.org backslash heart care. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.